as I said, today's talk, we're focusing on session one of the July online auction, which is decorative arts items and the eye of the decorator. And I'm going to hand over to our decorative arts specialists, which is of course, Vanessa Phillips and Sophie Louise Froelich, and they will take it from there. Okay. Can everyone see here? Yeah? yeah, that's perfect. Okay. And Vanessa, you're just on mute. We've got 90 lots in the first session of uh, decorative arts sale. And what you're looking at is a cartoon of the Sun King. And there he is uh, with his decorator on the right hand side of your screen. And there's a great flurry of activity, as you can all see. Wonderful possessions are being brought in and are being offered. Um, and there's this very strong relationship between the Sun King on your left and the decorator or advisor, art advisor on the right. And I think that is really what we're going to acknowledge today, that we are lucky enough to have some super duper wonderful lots from very, very lovely homes. And these homes were put together by collectors, but with the aid of design, interior design uh, decorators, who, whose impeccable eye basically pulls many of these collections together. Um, it's not everybody that is gifted and can go out and find objects that speak to each other, be there tables or paintings it's really an art and it, a lot of it i think is highly intuitive and we are very lucky in this country that we have such terrific decorators um that there are many of them and i won't uh, mention one or two as we go along and please don't take offense to anybody if i don't uh, draw attention to um what you've been actually uh, undertaking so the the first image that you're looking at is um, the dining room at Curitiscule, which as you all know was the home of Cecil John Rhodes. And in uh, 1896, the top section of the house, of the, this very grand house, caught fire and burnt. Um, there was extensive damage and Rhodes was in Amitali at the time and he rushed back to the Cape and he immediately set about with his architects and um, to refurbish, redesign, rebuild, uh, replace whatever had been damaged by the fire. So he employed the services of a gentleman by the name of I am Arthur Colley, who had a very grand address of 39 Bond Street in London. And for two years, Mr. Colley procured wonderful objects for Critiscure. So he, um, he, he first of all went to the United Kingdom and then he went on to Holland and then he came to South Africa where he found the majority of the treasures that are in that wonderful, wonderful house. And we have, you know, we, we, when we are putting together a sale, we've, we always look at provenance um, and you'll just see a little clock in the bottom of your left-hand screen. It's lot 55. It's a very sweet and very nice uh, brass lantern clock by the Goldsmiths Company. And it's got a fantastic plaque, which is inscribed H.B. Dusselon in memory, C.J. Rhodes, the 10th of April, 1902. And we, we wondered what that was about. So we asked the family who are originally from Zimbabwe, just to tell us a little bit about this clock and what that plaque was about. So as you all know, when Rhodes died, his um, desire was to be buried at the Matopus um, Hills near uh, Bulawayo and uh, with the view of the world as it's known. And it this wasn't the most accessible area to actually get to. So the grave itself was atop a massive granite hill and um, it had to be hewn out of solid rock. Roads had to be put in literally to uh, be built to carry the gun carriage and um, the oxen, the, the black oxen team, which were, were maneuvering and getting the coffin up to this wonderful view. 
So the whole responsibility of the funeral was entrusted to um, Marshall Hoyle, who was the civil commissioner of Bulawayo at the time. And uh, Mr. H.B. Dusselong was the director of public works in Bulawayo. And um, the very difficult responsibility for constructing the last section of the road from Rose's farm in Westacre to the gravesite at World's View. He was the, the uh, engineer who took this on. And in uh, recognition of his service, he was presented with this very, very attractive lantern clock. But that's aside, um, the, we have uh, lots from Fergelechen, um, uh, Nordhoek estate, and the German industrialist. So if I, the, take you to the next side of Fergelechen. Um, there was a family division at Fergelechen in 2015, originally the house, as you all know, was the home of uh, Sir Lionel and Lady Phillips. And after Lady Phillips's death, Cynthia and Punch Barlow bought the home. And they too, together with their decorators, um, proceeded to furnish that home in that extraordinarily beautiful style. We were lucky enough to sell probably 20, 25 lots from the sale belonging to members of the Barlow family and the Barlow Trust. And that we did five years ago, but we did have the residue of one or two pieces from one member of the family. And if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, there is the seven light uh, brass candelabra, um, which looks rather lovely between a pair of vases, which we sold. Um, so you're looking at a very formal Cape house. You're looking at the Achterkammer and the Fuhrkammer and the type of furniture that was used in that home. Um, if we go to the next slide, you'll see um, that's the drawing room of Fergelechen as it was with the Barlow family. And you can see it's a very relaxed, lovely sitting room. Um, there's a lovely feeling there. You've got comfortable sofas, one or two tables dotted around the sides of the room. Very, very grand chandelier and a beautiful, beautiful mirror over the fireplace. And Obviously, they decorators and designers helped the family. They must have, if you look at those super curtains on the left-hand side, they could never. They must have been installed by somebody who really knew what they were doing. So, if you the, the, do look on the right-hand side, there's a commode uh, which we will again. Strauss and Company were lucky enough to sell, and. Um, that we sold in 2015 for an extraordinary amount of money of 2.5 million, but it had this brilliant provenance. And that was, had been acquired um, by, the, by the family and eventually was sold. The, we've, we've, we've got this very, very nice mirror as well, which um, again, we've, you can see with the provenances, it's very, very, it's George II in style and 15 to 20,000, extremely glamorous and a, a mirror that you could use in any home today. So I mentioned briefly uh, in the introduction that there are many, um, not many, but they are very, very specialized uh, interior designers, decorators. And when we mount our exhibitions, um, we call upon them. Um, in this case, we asked Gert Gertsen, who has been a decorator in this country for many, many years, for his assistance. And I think it's their intuition. Who would have dared take a Tretyakov painting, if you look on the right-hand side, with those very strong colors and put them on that pink wall? And they, the, there's a subtlety, there's an understanding of the object and a relationship to color, which I think very few of us have and that we need to possibly, I, I certainly do draw upon these very, very bright, clever people who understand where a piece of furniture belongs and how to hang a painting. 
they understand color and form, and they are very aware of how objects speak to each other. So I thought you'd be interested to know that we took over Morkel Hayes in March, and uh, Geert completely redecorated that house using the most gorgeous colors, and we were able to hang all our super duper pictures from the May sale. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sophie Louise because, as I mentioned earlier, we have a collection of various lots from different collectors, but we're very, very lucky to have um, some super Italian furniture from a German industrialist who came out to this country approximately 25 years ago. He was too busy to decorate his home, and so he employed the services of a Swiss German decorator who arrived at his home in Bishop's Court and had pre-prepared absolutely everything down to the copper da uh, drain pipes, the curtains, everything was brought in and the house was decorated for him. So I'm going to hand over to Sophie Louise because she's going to cover these fantastically pretty and useful objects, which I think there isn't a home that wouldn't enjoy to have them. Thanks, Vanessa. So yes, so this is not the home where that collection comes from, but what this, what this photograph shows us is how different objects from different times can be reinvented in a modern space. And I think for me, that's quite important is that just because it all, it's old doesn't mean it doesn't have a space in a new and a modern home. You can mix and match and you can make it work and it could, can look absolutely exquisite. So I'm going to introduce three different houses that we are very fortunate to have examples of um, on this online sale. And just please excuse my pronunciation if I do pronounce any of the French words incorrectly, but I shall do my best. So Maison Johnson is a Paris-based interior decorating artist, and it was founded in 1880 by a Dutch-born gentleman by the surname of Janssen. And this firm went truly global. So they service clients from Europe to the Americas and right through to the Middle East. From the beginning, they um, combined traditional furnishings with different influences and the new trends which were rising at that time. So Anglo-Japanese style, for example, arts and crafts movement, very prominent, and even the Turkish style. What they did, and a lot of these firms obviously uh, would have done as well is, is place a huge amount of importance on historical research and um, while still attempting to balance that, that look of being livable, usable and working in a modern and dramatic space and, and basically keeping everything relevant I suppose. Um, within the first 10 years it, the firm had become a major purchaser of the European antiques and what's quite interesting is by 1890, they established an antique gallery, which was a separate firm. And they even sold um, antiques to competitors as well, which was quite interesting to know. They are probably best known for um, Stefane Boudin, who joined the firm in the 1920s. He came from the textile trimming business background. His father had owned one of the largest textile trimming um, companies in France. And rumor has it he was also brought on board to augment the um, finances of the company at the time. But what he really brought was attention to detail, um, again, emphasis on historical accuracy, and just able, uh, he, like Vanessa says, these decorators have a specific eye, so he was able to transform a space into a memorable space. Under his leadership, um, Maison Johnson provided services to the royal families of Belgium, Iran, Serbia, for example, Elsie de Wolf. It did um, up her homes, Lady um, Olive's Leeds Castle in Kent, in England, and many more. So a mix of celebrities right through to royalty. But perhaps the most well-known work is the Red Room in the White House, which was done under the administration administration of John F. Kennedy. And it looks something like this. So again, you have this really unique space, you've got these amazing colors, and you're combining the old and the new, and it somehow just all blends together, it kind of works on the eyes, easy to look at. Might not be everybody's cup of tea, but it does appeal to a certain, um, certain collector, I would think. 
So on this day, lot 29 is a pair of fabulous lamps, um, also done in the French style. They are not made on Johnson, but they have incredible attention to detail. And if you look at just where the base is, that marble base, it, everything is molded as a canvas leaf. And if you look at the urn-shaped body, you've got these trails of foliage um, coming down. And they really are exquisite. They're actually quite tall for table lamps. But once lit up, they actually just illuminate the space and give it a completely different feel. And then we've got the first lot of the sale, which are these two um, side tables, or coffee tables. And we've said in the cataloging they're possibly by Maison Johnson, because if you look at the feet, they've got that hoof foot. And if you look at the top of the curve of your leg, you've got that uh, seahorse um, visage. And if you have a look at Johnson, they often have seahorse or cheval headed legs. And um, that stretch is very prominent in, in, in a lot of their tables. And the style, the overall look is very much there. So although the tables aren't marked, um, that is why we've attributed them to possibly be from the house. Um, and they, they, again, I think what they really show is the modern style with a twist of the old, but still keeping that relevant modern look. My favorite house is La Maison Charles. It was founded in 1908 in Paris, and they do, I think, really special work. Um, <clears throat> it began with Ernest Charles, who took over the Ullman Bronze Works, and the company at that stage had earned a reputation for reproducing ancient lamps. And 1932, Emile Charles uh, joined in with his brother Pierre, and the company was rebranded Charles Fairer. 1959, he was joined by his two sons, um, one having been first in his class at Ecole Bull in the interior design and wood sculpture department, and the other a graduate of the arts appliqué in interior design. So really, this is a very much uh, a firm grounded in um, being family run, and every person who came and has joined from this family subsequently even has really brought their own dimension to to the firm while still staying true to the overall design um, thread. 1960 we have some more of the family joining in and what we see is a blend of classicism, precision and contemporary touches to represent a slightly new approach to lighting and decor. Um, and this time, most of their famous lamps were introduced. Epidemes was one that you'll see a bit later on. And throughout this time, this firm really has gone from strength to strength. They have branched out in later years into the hotel industry, into luxury living. Um, they've serviced top clients all over the world, and they've won numerous awards. Their, their CV is far too long to, <laughs> to go through here. But what does, that, what does it look like? So these are just examples of interiors that they would have done up. On the left-hand side, you'll see an example of one of the hotels. On the right-hand side, um, it's the private residence. And, and they are really known for that. They will go into private homes, do them up, um, and they come up. I mean, these are just two examples, but they really have the most fantastic look and finishes by the end of it. Um, and so here we have lot 19 and 21 and it's actually really nice to have two pairs of exactly the same four sconces i think vanessa you'll agree one doesn't often find two pairs of the same <laughs> no no and the the quality of these is absolutely extraordinary um, they're very heavy um, and what was fun about them is that they i found them in the german industrious bathroom and i thought well, gosh those are incredibly nice for bathroom fittings and I thought they'd be quite fun for us. I'm sure they'll find a home not in a bathroom yeah. next time around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just shows you what you can do. <laughs> and these are marked, so they do have their uh, Maison Charles um, stamp. And then we thought we'd give you a sneak peek of what's coming up in October. So we have Epidemie, which I mentioned earlier. This is, this is one lamp. We actually have a pair coming up from the same home. So that's really, really exciting. Um, I love these. I think they're just so funky and cool and different. Um, and again, I think what's also lovely is when you light up these lamps, the play of light just changes the whole dimension of what you're looking at. 
And in the last half, we've got this, uh, is Italian, Franzi Ferenc. Um, and they began in Florence in 1899 with an artisan, Giuseppe. He restored mirrors and chandeliers. And he also worked at noble residences within the city center. He had a son and a daughter who between the 1950s and 40s um, restored antiques and also began to create their own fixtures. So they would travel a lot um, and through their travels and different influences, these unique uh, fixtures would come to life using different mediums. And over time that became known as bunchies. So from chandeliers to lamps, um, they really produced everything. And the, what we have on this sale is what they call their natural look. Um, they have these fantastical lamps that are molded in glass with, they look like tulips or um, roses and they all come to life. So the first one we have is this fern chandelier. So as you can see the basket and then these fern leaves issue out from there. Um, and it's a four light actually, so lot 131. And then this is some of the, one of the molded glass examples. They use Murano glass and the glass is obviously colored. So this one pinks and, and uh, white, I suppose, if you're off white. Um, and then if you like those, you've got the fitting wall, the matching, sorry, the matching wall fittings to go with it. So quite spectacular, something very different. Like I said, it's not necessarily something everyone will, will like and enjoy, but it does, it does add a bit of fun to the home if that's what you're looking for. Vanessa, I'm going to hand back over to you because you really enjoy these little, little ones. Well, well, from the same home, uh, we found these absolutely charming Maria Amelia reverse paintings. And for those of that you don't, I certainly didn't know who she was, um, but uh, she was born in 1961. And what intrigued me was there was a Stephanie Hoppen label on the back of these. And for those of you who don't know, Steph Stephanie Hoppner has her decorating studio, mostly prints. She's a very important London dealer. She's ex-South African. Um, her parents owned Rex 2 form. And she's got a fantastic atelier in Walton Street. So I was became intrigued by these. And I thought they were absolutely, I, I'm sure you'll agree, they are such fun. Yeah. Um, she, the, uh, Maria Amelia, um, she comes from a very talented family. Her father's a sculptor, Bartolini, and her, she's followed in her mother's footsteps, who also practiced this extraordinary reverse painting. She even goes into the details of the frames. And I think you can see that those frames, they're painted by her as well. And for anybody who doesn't know what reverse painting is, it's the process by which the layers of each new coat are um, they're built up on the glass and each layer conceals another layer below beneath it um, and when it's from the perspective of the reverse side of the glass that you see the image um, I, I just think they're absolutely lovely and we didn't put them in for a lot of money i think we've tempting you all at a thousand to fifteen hundred rand and we dare you to just bid on them they're absolutely sensational <laughs> And then we've got this ice bucket, which is also Italian on the left hand side. Franco Lagini is the designer. Um, it's again, it's a, it's a nice piece, um, works very well in, in, in any home. What's fun about it is the motif and it's all grape vines and, and with bunches of grapes hanging from it. And then the sides are also, the handles are actually leaves. Um, so it, it's not just something that's useful but it's actually an artwork in itself that can be a, a centerpiece of discussion. And of course, then we do have a wine on this online auction. So if you're buying this, you have to buy a bottle of wine to go with it. So that's the one on the left. And then on the right, we've got a Portuguese piece, don't we, Vanessa? Yeah, it's from Old Porto. Um, I mean, it's not an old, old example. It's from 1938 to 1984. And um, again, it, it was purchased, Sophie Louise, with, for the German industrialists by the decorator from the, the Schloss Hoberlein. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, Sophie Louise. 
um, yes, I'm trying to, sorry, Vanessa, just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on to this one, which is the, also again, Franco Leghini, a centerpiece. Um, it's, it's an acorn centerpiece, I suppose acorn leaves and then you've got your three little acorns where you can put your lights in and then these are lovely these are um decanters but they're quite special the cat camas decanters i think you'll know more about those well um camas obviously the cognac um they commissioned baccarat to make these fantastic decanters and um they were in the house on a gilded tray. And I thought, goodness, those look, those look incredibly uh, smart and beautifully, beautifully made. So beautifully blown. And I went and had a look at them and each one is obviously engraved and it's a commission for the cognac house. Um, but very, very nice quality. The name just come back to me, it's Schloss Herberlingen. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's what you were referring to, sorry. <laughs> And then we have these um, Dutch plates. So we've got mm. this lot, got two pieces, and this lot, mm. yeah. So going wow. back to the story, yes. Yeah. Well, they, the, these are lovely because, again, they're 18th century Dutch plates. But you can see the, the plate on the right has, has the complete influence of the Chinese, uh, you know, the balustrated garden, the rocky outcrop, and those very stylized flowers. Mm. Um, and the one on the left is more in the European taste with uh, the cornucopia and the flowers. But they're lovely size, these plates, uh, much larger than we normally see, um, 35 centimeters diameter. And these are quite nice because they've got the yellow rim and those are yeah. quite special, aren't they? They've got that de Clau. Yes, they're de Clau, so highly collectible if you are interested in Dutch uh, Tim Glaze, Fayence, where they are very, very nice examples of that factory's work. And then we've got these Russian boxes. So what's quite nice about this is, first of all, you don't really see Russian boxes that often at market. Uh, and here we have a ready-made collection almost, don't we? I mean, all these different sizes and, and yeah, motifs. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and they're not old, but they were collected by uh, uh, one person and she went to Russia several times and she collected particular workshops that she was interested in and obviously subject matter. Um, but lovely collection, you know, if, if any of there are any collectors out there or you're thinking of starting a collection, this is a good point to start from. Um, they're very reasonably, they've got very good reasonable estimates and they're nice quality, beautifully executed. Mm. I think they represent uh, some of the good and very, very well-known workshops in Russia today. And then we have this fun um, lot. So if you, anyone is into top hats and opera hats, these are great. And it's the first time I actually saw a collapsible opera hat, which um, you press it down and it goes under your seat. And then when you go back out, you can un concertina it or how do you say that you put it back on your head and walk out and look all smart so um these are from knightsbridge but i think you have a better understanding of hats vanessa especially when it comes to men's hats don't you oh well no, i love hats. <laughs> I, love, I love this so they they've got the the former owner's initials um if you have a look at the inside i think that's rather nice and they're on the case as well um well, you know, all the top, the top uh, hatters are in the Piccadilly, St. James area. So I can see why um, these have a lot of appeal. So the, this lot, um, it's, it, it's a Regency example. It's incredibly grand. It would look fantastic as just one statement in a dining room with modern dining room furniture. It's, in, it's functional and it's just a beautifully made piece of furniture. And unfortunately, pieces like this are not making the prices that they did. Um, tastes have changed. Uh, children don't want, they want what their parents had and they want their own style. But to anchor a room with such a beautiful sideboard would 
really, really, um, I think, make all the other pieces in the room sing. Um, it's just such a pity that furniture like this is not realizing the type of value that it used to. It's all to do with styles, changing styles, collectors, different choices. <laughs> Yeah, and then we've got the this pair, which is also again unusual. So the the urns on top, the urn vases, urn shaped vases, are separate to the actual pillars. Um, but when we saw them in the house, they had flowers in them, these huge, fantastic bunches of flowers, and they actually looked really impressive when we walked into the front door. Yeah, oh, they're, they're very, very, very nicely painted. I suspect that the bases are probably uh, French and the urns are, could well be Italian. Uh, very stylish. You could, you, you know, you could place them anywhere. Entrance hall, also in a dining room. Mm, it's a different statement piece, isn't it? Yeah. And let's see what's next. So then... Thanks to, we have to say thank you to Mia. Um, she created these fabulous rooms for us. And the idea was that we could show you what you can actually do with these pieces. So it's just sometimes nicer to have them in a setting. So this was our traditional classic look that we thought could work. There's a lovely knoll sofa on the, okay. sorry, if you have a look in the center there, there's a beautiful, Oh, it's really well made, a knoll sofa, um, which came from uh, Nordhog Manor, and such a fantastic quality that one can find on our auctions. And this was the more contemporary look, so mixing and matching. Here we have some of session two, actually, um, on the wall, and this fabulous little lamp. Um, and it just all comes together quite quite nicely when you actually start to to play a bit, I suppose, would be the right word, wouldn't it? I think so. And, and we, we really incorporated those because Matthew was going to join us today and talk about um, the Johannesburg Bar, which had all these extraordinary, they have such fun pieces. And we, we thought that if we gave people an insight that they could use both modern and the traditional, just mixing and matching, as you said. And if you didn't like that, we did ask for a third option, which is this, which is our modern look. Um, so you can really see how, so here are those, those fire tables I talked about, your ice bucket, the null sofa again, incorporating the, the Italians on this side in the form of lamps. Um, and then we have here, a piece of copper as well so it all it all interchange yeah it all kind of blends together and works together and um yeah just gives you an idea of what you can use and what what might work for you so if any of this is interesting you have to go to session one and you have to click that little button that says bit <laughs> We always encourage people to keep bidding. So, <laughs> or you can leave an, an, an absentee bid permission bid and just put in the amount that you would like to bid up to and the system will do that for you. Um, I think that's all from my side though. I think so. Um, I think there's some quite fun pipes if you have a look at that image. They're, they're by Dunhill and there's a lovely humidor uh, uh, on the left-hand side. And those also come from the German industrialist. And in October, we'll be selling a collection of his pipes. There are um, 366 pipes, all by Dunhill, one for every day, um, and of course, one for leap year. So that's something to look forward to then. But we do encourage you, and we hope you will have fun looking at these lovely, lovely objects that we've been lucky enough to sell or to offer to you. Thanks. Yeah. 